Right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Bluebird Hill uh, Inn and Winery. We're in Monroe. It's July 20th, 2020. We're here with Nick Cheatham. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first question for you and most important question for what we're doing here is why wine? Yeah, I, it's interesting. I think wine kind of grabs you. So I came from a small town in Eastern Oregon uh, named Ontario and it's kind of onion country. Nothing for grapes for miles and, and I didn't even know Idaho had a wine industry before I came to college. So I came to Oregon State in 2012 and my intention was to brew beer and then I kind of went through my first year and went back home and worked back home for a little bit and came back and really started getting into my core curriculum programs in the brewing and wine um, kind of focus and uh, that was about the time when everyone starts looking for internships and they go to their career fairs and they look for you know brewing and wine and food science internships and I started talking with a lot of the breweries and I discovered I wasn't really like super interested and at that time it was kind of the peak of the brewing kind of scene and they were looking for people with a lot of experience under their belts already for internships so uh, I was actually kind of dejected and was walking out of the career fair a little bit discouraged and A to Z Wineworks had a booth at the very entrance and I kind of overlooked them as I walked in. So on my way out, uh, um, one of the people there at the booth, I think it was Karen Peterson and um, Olivier Prost, and they kind of pulled me aside and they're like, hey, we just want to talk to you and they seemed really friendly so I, I walked over to the booth and they kind of started talking to me about wine and the wine industry and I had no clue about it and uh, they encouraged me to apply for an internship opportunity there at A to Z. And so I got in touch with you know, the, the people at A to Z and uh, they surprisingly, to my surprise anyway, they, they offered me the internship with no experience and uh, that's just kind of how the thing goes in the wine industry I guess and they even extended that opportunity to work the summer before the harvest on their bottling line. So my first real job in the wine industry was on the bottling line at A to Z in 2014. And then it's kind of proliferated from there. <laughs> you just, yeah, I just fell in love with uh, the people, the community, you know, how tight knit everything felt in the industry. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah even though I worked so hard that on the bonnie line, I'd never worked on assembly stuff before, and it just kind of pulls you in. So you're, you had your, you know, obviously you're, you're, the background works for both, you're doing fermentation science, you're doing wine and food, you kind of, kind of studies. Tell me about, mm -hmm. uh, as, you, as you went to A to Z and as you're continuing your education, tell me about sort of focusing in on winemaking or on the wine side of things, and, <laughs> and what it was that drew you in to wine from the production side? Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think for a few years, even until up until now, I've been fighting kind of whether or not I wanted to be on the wine side or the vineyard side. And uh, uh, I went a lot of different places. I went to New Zealand and I did an internship there. And before that, I was at Adelsheim. I did an internship with them. And the summer before Adelsheim, they, they offered me an opportunity in their vineyards. So I was able to work at Adelsheim in their vineyards. I worked in the Rex Hill vineyards. And I've always kind of been between the wine production side and the, the vineyard side. So um, yeah, after I returned from New Zealand, I, I started here. And I'd kind of known about Bluebird Hill before that. I'd been working a few weekends in 2016. And I went to New Zealand in 2018, so yeah, kind of, kind of going all over the place mm -hmm. here. But uh, yeah, I was. I, it's been kind of a push and pull between whether or not I should be in the wine side or the vineyard side, and ultimately ended up at a place I could do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me what appeals to you about both sides. What appeals to me about both sides is how nice it is to do multiple things in a day or in a week or in a month. I, I get to see 
the grape growing and I get to be a part of that. I'm out there in the vineyard most of the time doing the work. Um, I'm the only full-time employee here and uh, you know when that's done I hop over and start topping barrels and and working on on the wine side. So I think that's what draws me in is not being able to or not being stuck in one aspect of the wine production side and I think that kind of suits my personality too. I'm kind of this uh, dynamic person with multiple interests and I'm very fortunate to have that in a job. So you started A to Z. Tell me about the kind of experience there and, and sort of what you took away from, from your first kind of entree into the wine industry. If I hadn't worked at A to Z, I don't think, it's hard to say whether or not I'd be in the wine industry. Um, yeah, like I said, the community aspect really pulled me into the whole wine scene and how friendly people were and how cool it was to meet and work with other people from other countries. And, you know, for a small town kid from Eastern Oregon who never had seen the wine industry before or stepped foot in a winery or met people from other countries before, I mean, that's, that's really what drew me in is like just the worldly aspect to it and the community aspect to it and how friendly people were and um, I was fortunate enough to be able to speak Spanish so when I was out in the vineyards I got to, you know to acquaint myself with uh, a lot of the workers out there and make friends with them and that was being being half Hispanic uh, that that was a big part of why I ended up in the wine industry. About the work itself, obviously starting out you're, you're not exactly doing glorious tasks. So tell, me, <laughs> tell me about the work itself and, and, and what about it, uh, e e despite it being hard, made you want to continue and, and, and do more? I think, uh, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not easy work and it's a really big shock to someone to uh, to step into something that big on the A to Z scale particularly, you know, and work those many hours. I, I didn't, I had no idea what I was getting into really. And I think the people in the industry kind of pull you through it. Yeah. And uh, my background with like endurance sports and my interest for that kind of, I guess, pain or endurance <laughs> kind of thing is it drives me I like I like that aspect to it and the buzz of the harvest just there's something about it that keeps you going everyone working hard you know you're all in it together it's a it's a team effort all around the world everyone knows what you're going through you're not alone and <laughs> I think that's yeah like I, it goes back to the community the family aspect so you mentioned some of the places you worked, um, Alessheim especially, you got to kind of see both sides at Alessheim, work, working vineyard and, and working and, and working uh, 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 bottling. Yeah. Uh, tell me about uh, that experience specifically and, and kind of, um, again, kind of what you took away, what you, what you learned at Alessheim. At Alessheim, yeah, uh, tremendous opportunity there. That was a, such a cool experience. Jumping from A to Z, I think, Let's see, that, so A to Z was 2014 and 15, and then I took the harvest off in 15, and then so 16, so 17, I was at Adelsheim, and that was, just, that was the year I graduated college, and it was kind of my first real dive back into full-time production, and it was such a good feeling getting back into that kind of rhythm and routine and seeing a different level of production and a different way to do things. That was really what Adelsheim showed me. It was a to Z is this giant and they, they, they do such a good job of putting out consistent products at that volume and then going to Adelsheim where they do the same, but like on a smaller scale and seeing the smaller scale equipment and just the way things are done on that 
on that level was uh, was a lot. Uh, I took away a lot from that. And meeting new people, obvi obviously, the networking aspect is um, tremendous too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun at a or Adelson and A to Z. <laughs> Uh, and then in New Zealand, you mentioned, why, why did you choose there and, and tell me about that experience. So, <laughs> I met quite a few Kiwis and my experiences and my harvests. Um, and I kept asking around what was like the best place. I'd never been out of the countries, right? So you take a small town kid and put him in this industry I've never heard of and take him away from home who's never been out of the country and I was asking around like what what's the easiest way to like do this harvest abroad thing that everyone's doing and talking about like what's like the easiest country to go to and navigate and kind of tour and do the outdoor scene that I was interested in and um, the obvious answer for, for a lot of people was uh, New Zealand so I became really interested in that and I went through an exchange program and um, ended up staying with a few of my friends that I met on harvest at A to Z in 2015 and living with them and uh, it's just like it's a cool thing to say yeah, I have friends in other parts of the world and I <laughs> stayed with them and they were so kind to open their doors um, yeah so yeah, I went to New Zealand and worked at Villa Maria, which was huge. I, uh, when I was talking to the exchange program coordinator, they mentioned that <laughs> Villa was a medium-sized company. And I was like, okay, well, well Out of Time's a medium-sized kind of company, but I didn't realize <laughs> it was all relative to the scale of what the country or region produces. <laughs> I should have done more research then. Uh, yeah, it was a, that was a that was a tough that was a tough harvest. Why is that? It was it was very it was very big. It felt like a part of the craft that I was working towards and was kind of getting away at that scale. And they do a good job. But they have great wine, really great wine, and phenomenal people who work there. But it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I was I was kind of. Looking something, looking for something more along the scale of Adelsheim or 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 Bluebird or mm -hmm. you know something where there were just a few or fewer number of people doing the tasks and the, the crews were so large in New Zealand and that was a that was a sh kind of a shock to me. <laughs> and, and and getting there and the first day of orientation uh, there was a lot of people and everyone had to wear hard hats I was like whoa what is this what's going on here <laughs> what did I get myself into walking out to the tank from a, oh man yeah yeah what, a, what an interesting experience uh, I don't regret it it was it was a good it was a good opportunity for me to both work out of the country get that experience under my belt and see what wine production is like in other regions of the world and obviously meet new people and I met a lot of really really awesome great people down there and had the, the tremendous opportunity to travel for a few weeks while I was down there and then yeah after after I um, came back from New Zealand I picked up out here at Bluebird Hill and I'd, I had started that winter before I went down to the Southern Hemisphere here at Bluebird Hill after my internship at, Ad at Adelsheim ended. So mm -hmm. kind of went that way and hopped back over here and carried out the rest of the harvest in 2018 at that point, yeah. So before we get back to Bluebird Hill, uh, I'm curious about, you mentioned you, you start out at like the, one of the biggest Oregon wineries, if not the biggest Oregon winery in yeah. production, and you go to a, a kind of a, a medium, again, medium-sized by Oregon, Yeah. and you go to New Zealand and work at a giant place. I'm, I'm curious about 
the logistical differences that you learn and you saw either either between the three or specifically between Oregon and New Zealand? What were the biggest sort of differences on a day to day or week to week or month to month scale of, of the work you were doing? And, and and what was it about New Zealand that you found less appealing? Yeah, yeah. I, so A to Z, by the time I had left, were just finishing their kind of expansion of their new buildings and stuff. So I didn't really work at A to Z, at the A to Z that it is now. So when I was there, we still had a rotation of, you know, six days on and one day off. And we, we did a pretty good job of holding to that schedule. And it was the same in New Zealand, but the, man, the work was, for some reason, it seemed a lot harder. <laughs> this is a, just the scale of things was tremendous. Uh, I was, I was, I shouldn't uh, complain too much because I was fortunate enough to be on the Pinot Noir production team, which was a lot smaller than the Sauv Blanc production team, and uh, we got we got things done a lot quicker with the scale of equipment there. But just. Um, it just felt like a kind of a concrete jungle in there and less less of the you were less connected to the vineyard mm -hmm. and I think that's really what kind of drove me to be more favorable to kind of the Oregon scene and the A to Z side scene that before I went to New Zealand I, you know I was like oh well I did I did A to Z that, that should be pretty easy that gives me kind of some experience right like New Zealand that should be a breeze uh, I, I to be frank, I didn't really do much research before I went down there. I just wanted to get a harvest abroad experience under my belt, and that's what I went down there to, to do, is just see what it was like to, to work in another country, and I'm super grateful for that opportunity and that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest difference there was uh, the scale of equipment, the number of employees working at a different time, and they worked 24 hours a day. So at A to Z, we did not we did kind of a, a swing shift mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like a crew went in at 6 a.m. to 6 and then, or 7, and then we picked up, you know, kind of in the middle of the day to, end up, to round out the day at A to Z. And then in New Zealand, I was, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. <laughs> so that was <laughs> my first graveyard shift kind of kind of deal, and that was a good thing for someone to experience. <laughs> <laughs> I like you it. Want, yeah, if you want to know what the wine industry is like, you got to do a graveyard shift or two. In a country you've never been in before. In a country yeah. you've never been in. <laughs> in a country, yeah, for a person who's never traveled out of the country before, Kid, yeah, it was good. It was a good opportunity. So along the way, you're you're doing all the different kinds of tasks. You're you're working on you're working on different parts of, of the winemaking process. Tell me about sort of what you were bringing with you in terms of winemaking style, or philosophy, or desire. Like what did you what, what did you what did you see that you liked that you wanted to replicate? What did you see that you didn't want to take with you? From a particular place, or just overall? Kind of overall. Oh, yeah, there's there's a lot that sticks with me and um, there's a lot I'm still, there's a lot to learn still, um, particularly on the white wine production side. I've, I've kind of been relegated to the w red wine production teams when it, wherever I go and um, that's given me a lot of experience with, with Pinot Noir production, um, but I, I really feel like I'm kind of missed out on some of the white wine production. But Having said that, I'm learning a lot here and um, tasting a lot of a lot of white wines around the valley and around the world just to get a more refined palate of kind of what I would like to to do here and and in the future. Um, as far as Pinot Noir production goes, I take a lot of I take a lot of um, perspective from my experience at A to Z and Rex Hill and seeing stuff done on a smaller scale because I can put that to to work here at a very small scale winery and see how things are done there and the same with Adelsheim and 
um, incorporating those smaller scale techniques with kind of the the larger scale um, efficiency. Mm -hmm. I think I think those coupled together have been a really good thing to see and experience. I just I just picture when I was at Rex Hill how I was on the A to Z team, but I would hop over and work with the Rex Hill kind of squad. We were separated and just see how they were doing their Pinot Noir production and um, the vibrancy of and the richness of the color that was being extracted in the bins and the smaller tanks. And you can't really see that when you're doing it in when you're pumping into a large tank. So seeing what those fermentations were like and the, what the wine production was going through on those smaller scales was really helpful to me. You know, you kind of absorb a lot by seeing and being a part of that atmosphere. And mm -hmm. you, know, you ask someone who's on their seventh harvest when it's your first or second harvest, what, what's going on or what do you think or what do you see? And they, they provide what, whatever their perspective is. And yeah, I think all those experiences coupled with meeting, meeting all those people who have all these other experiences really lends itself to a diverse palette or um, perspective on wine. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you see certain characteristics in wines that you wanted to emulate? Did you see certain things about color, aroma, texture, flavor that you were like, this is what I want to do? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really fell in love with the, the, the wines at Rex Hill. I liked I like that bolder, kind of extracted mo style of Pinot Noir production and uh, working out in the vineyards too, it was the same thing, uh, working at the Jacob Hart Vineyard and all of the other vineyards that go into the Rex Hill bottles with the crews and the way they did stuff in the vineyard, I try to emulate here and it's cool that uh, I get to do that on my own mo for the most part. and. As young as I am, like what a what a cool opportunity! I'm so grateful for that that I get to emulate the people I admire and the and the wine production and the vineyard styles I admire. And the same thing at Adelsheim. Um, really, really tremendous quality um, wines. But I think your first impression is your strongest too. So I think that's why Rex Hill sticks out in my mind the most. And uh, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of those, those people and occasionally they'll message me in Spanish on Facebook and stuff and ask me how I'm doing. And it means a lot to me to be included, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Rex Hill was a really cool experience. And, and Michael Davies is an amazing winemaker. So are the rest of those, those people out there. I'm curious with the vineyard in particular, what, what were the techniques that you saw that were things you, you've, you've tried to bring with you? What was that? With the vineyard in particular, what were the techniques you saw that you try, you've tried to bring with you? Yeah, at, uh, at Rex Hill, I, I distinctly remember how, <laughs> how kind of concentrated the, the colors in the fruit looked by the time we you hit Verazon and we began leaf pulling. and. We leaf pulled until the until the whole fruiting zone was bare, and wow, that was that was a tremendous thing to witness, and and consequently spraying you know kale and clay on them to protect them from sunburn. But just the richness of the of the color and the berries, uh, I, I I I have this image in my head of what the the grapevines look like and what the vineyard looked like and how uniform and pristine it all was and and I yeah I try to I, I carry that image with me and try to emulate that and just, when those berries that or the those grape clusters that we worked so hard on all all summer the crew worked so hard on all summer rolled into the the winery and they began processing them I 
you begin to understand where that extraction and that richness in the in the wine comes from. It starts starts here in the vineyard, and uh, having being able to have my hands in that here at Bluebird Hill was it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. You mentioned that you'd, you'd heard of Bluebird Hill before uh, before you started working here. I'm, I'm curious what. How, how did you find out about the opportunity and what drew you to, to want to be here? Yeah, uh, so I would, what year was it? I was, I was pretty busy with school at that time. I, I had um, taken this opportunity to become an ambassador for the College of Agriculture, Forestry and Natural Resources at Oregon State University and in my free time on the weekends I would come out here to Bluebird Hill this was in 2016. I would come out here to Bluebird Hill and just help out with bottling and some of the wine production and whatever was going on in the vineyard, shoot thinning at that time. And um, yeah, Neil, the owner, and Sue, his wife, they they um, reached out to me. Neil was my one of my food science professors at Oregon State University, and. Um, he approached me as I was walking through the hall one day. I, I was kind of, I was kind of like not really um, interested in the food science kind of side. I'd, at, by that point, I'd really focused on the wine stuff, and I was just kind of getting through all the other classes. That, <laughs> but uh, I mean, his his course is phenomenal, and uh, I uh, distinctly re remember walking through the hall one day and. Neil approached me and I was kind of the kid who really sat in the back of the class in that in a lot of the, my food science courses and I was like uh, how does he no, even know me and he's like hey I heard you do wine stuff and I was like yeah I worked at A to Z and I did this and that and he said well we have a small winery we're we're uh, we're starting and I think they had they officially opened their tasting room that very first year I was there, 2016, and so I helped them open on Memorial Day, and um, yeah, that's kind of how the whole opportunity started. I was like, yeah, I'll help you out, this sounds like a good good opportunity. Um, I'm not scared of trying new things, so I was, man, super grateful that that kind of just happened. Yeah, who, who just walks through the hall one day and gets hired to work at a production, yeah. I think that's, yeah, what my experience at Oregon State has afforded me, some networking and uh, other opportunities. So once you're here, and especially once once you're back from New Zealand and, and, you're, and you're totally here, tell me about sort of finding your way, finding your role, finding how you're gonna make as the only full-time employee, mm -hmm. how you're going to make it work here, how you're going to split your time up, what you're going to be doing. Like, tell me, just sort of tell me about the kind of evolution of, of your role at yeah. Bluebird Hill. Yeah, so, so after I got back from New Zealand, that was in 2018, we, uh, we just, you know, the vineyard starts growing at that time. I come back and all the vines had been laid down and um, we just kind of go through the vineyard practices and the motions of um, vineyard production and whatever needed, else needed to be done in terms of wine production. Should we stop? No, it's all okay. good. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Got to roll, roll with the animals. We never get through interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it, so we get through the, the, the harvest and that was, yeah. Where were we? Uh, 2018. 2018. Come back from New Zealand. Um, what was the question? Oh, so I'm sort of curious about how you sort of found your role here. Once once you're back from New Zealand and, and you're the the only employee here, how you're finding your role and how you're gonna how you're gonna make this all work and what <laughs> yeah. you're and what you're gonna be doing. Yeah, it's still it's still a learning process. I'm still <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it all out. But I obviously have a lot more perspective on it now with my experience. Um, in, in the Oregon industry in New Zealand and um, after I finished harvest here in 2018 I had to go home for a few months and I worked in the Idaho wine industry um, 
for seven months at Hat Ranch Winery and um, another opportunity popped up back in the valley and I found myself at Duck Pond for harvest and then um, did a short time at, at Stoller solely in the vineyard um, this past winter before um, uh, we we kind of reconnected here at Bluebird. Uh, yeah, they had filled my my positions during during the time that I that I was absent. So, uh, being able to come back to that this year and see where all the wines are that we processed together and the grapes that we worked on together, mm. blend those out this these past couple months and. Um, really see it all come together is quite a cool experience because that's the first really the first time I've seen a wine that I helped make come around full circle because I I had been in harvests and vineyards up until that point and kind of only seen bits and pieces of the wine production so seeing a wine come full circle to the blending and then soon to be bottled it will help me make decisions from here on out. Mm -hmm. um, gives me a lot larger vision for what this site produces, what uh, we can do as a company moving forward and you know also kind of refines my palate to suit this space, right? Because every place is gonna is gonna have a different um, profile that you want to you want to showcase. So here in the Monroe Hills and this region of the Willamette Valley, um, I want to do whatever I can to showcase that flavor profile here. So now, seeing those wines come full circle, I'll have that. Um, Ability. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me about this place and and, and what what you've learned about it. What makes it special and, and 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 kind of what that profile is that you're going for. Yeah. What what makes this place special is one. It's really really small scale. Um, this is kind of a a region that's kind of out of the way or in between a lot of other wine regions in the Willamette Valley or sub sub AVAs and stuff. Uh, this site particularly is really hot. It's a pretty hot site, and so are a lot of these other sites out in this in this area. Um, so that it kind of goes with what I've been wanting to produce this whole time. It's this, these kind of bolder, extracted Pinot Noirs really showcase some of that um, other side of their flavor profiles and the ability of the of this grape. And also, you know, we have. We have five or six different clones of Pinot Noir here. Uh, we have Pinot Gris, we have Chardonnay, and also that this site will lend itself to different flavors for those grapes, and I'm still discovering what, what um, those flavor profiles are, because like I said, I, I'm still discovering what um, type or what avenue I'd like to pursue with the wine production and, and Neil and, and Sue really have a good refined palate and I'm learning from them you know what what they see in this in this site and what their vision is for um, these wines that they want to produce too mm -hmm. so for the Pinot Gris we do uh, all barrel fermentations we kind of do an all sauce style of wine production and really beautiful cool pinot gris that i never expected you know i i tasted other pinot gris and a lot of them are stainless and they're good but the the barrel fermentation and small scale production lends itself to a, a whole different profile mm -hmm. so yeah going back to what we were talking about just how tangible the site is it's only three acres and I can have my hands in in all the grapes and all the vines within a matter of days or a week and 
have all these leaves pulled and everything hedged by hand. Everything we do here is by hand, so really getting a feel for wine production because you're, you're walking the rows every day. Um, you're seeing where the grapes are at. Uh, I think it's, I think it's really within reach, you know, so to speak, with a site this small and uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool to be able to do that. How lucky! <laughs> You've mentioned that a couple of t a couple of times. The kind of you kind of good fortune and, and and being in a spot like this. Um, I'm curious in terms of the responsibility and and, uh, and maybe the pressure that, that comes with that of, of being the person in charge of all of the viticulture and winemaking um, and of being the one to make all the decisions or uh, many of the decisions. So tell me about the, 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 that kind of the, the confidence that you have to have or that you're building to, to make those kinds of decisions and and how you how you make them, how you make them in the moment, how you how you plan out your year, how you how you decide how the grapes and how the wines are going to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I guess I don't think about it. I just, it sounds... <laughs> Sorry to put pressure on yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I haven't, haven't like, given much thought to that. Uh, we, we do a good job communicating um, our team here, Neil and Sue and I and um, Alexis, and, who, who is a student at Oregon State. She's in the program as well. Uh, we, we all do a good job of communicating what the vision is and what kind of wines we like and we're not dogmatic so to speak about what uh, kind of production we like. I think we all have a very similar palette which helps which helps tremendously and especially on a small team. Um, as far as like the management side goes with the vineyard uh, I kind of, I'm still learning a lot. I, I didn't, my, most of my coursework was in fermentation science and I tried to supplement my coursework as much as I could with some of the soil science classes and vineyard management courses in my last year of college. Um, I was really busy with running the Vitus Club, which is the winemaking club at Oregon State and being an ambassador, so I tried my hardest to get um, some of that vineyard exp um, knowledge mm -hmm. from those courses too. So I'm using, I'm employing those um, aspects, but also just the experiences I've had working at Rex Hill, at Adelsheim, um, in the vineyards in Idaho, which are a little bit different, but it's all mostly the same thing. So I think the experience portion of the vineyard side has really given me that that vision for what what we're doing here in the vineyard mm -hmm. and you now I ask my friends what they're doing I, I look around on Instagram and see what other people where other people around here are at and and uh, just pay attention to what's going on um, and on three acres it's, it's it's not so much that it'll get away from you you know so that's really been a really great opportunity to have a to gain a feel for what the site's doing and what management practices need to be done um, and the same goes for for wine mm -hmm. the wine making aspect and the, and the main maintenance of those barrels and the bottles and stuff we don't have as many tools <clears throat> as other bigger places but we have enough and it works well yeah so you kind of talked about this a little bit but I'm curious if you had to articulate your winemaking philosophy what, what, what how would you describe your philosophy behind your winemaking my philosophy behind my winemaking I think it's evolving but the foundation is letting the site speak for itself and letting the vintage speak for itself not you know low intervention is a, a big thing that I think appeals to me and to Neil and Sue so our 
a few of our wines are unfiltered and unfined and we're, we're perfectly happy and proud to put out a product like that and we figure why not on such a small scale and let let the let the wines kind of and the site speak for itself um, I'm still learning a lot like I said I'm very very young in the industry so uh, I think my philosophy will be evolving a little bit here in the future but uh, as I learn more but obviously my that foundation goes back to those the colors and the richness of my experience my very first experience with A to Z and Rex Hill I kind of try to emulate some of those um, practices and protocols and and um, employ those with the site variants we see out here and and incorporate those practices with the the thing we're doing out here in the in the southern Willamette Valley. To kind of talk about this region being kind of an in-between spot. Uh, yeah. Obviously, in, be in between both in terms of population and, and in terms of wine. So, tell me about the, the about your neighborhood. I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, tell me about this. This kind of uh, you mentioned some of the things that the, some of the things the sites have in common. But tell me about some of the, some of your the winemaking neighbors down here and and kind of what this wine part of the world is like. Yeah. It, well, part of it, like working up there in the Newburgh and uh, Dayton and Dundee region, everyone's so connected. It's almost like another world up there. It's like a like a metropolis of <laughs> wine people. Uh, it's, it's not so much like that out here. It's very agricultural and uh, interspersed with um, distance and Christmas tree farms and other kind of crops and stuff whereas you know a lot of my experience up there was you you walk into a uh, Red Hills market and you run into I don't know, two or three friends that you know who are in the wine industry so that has been something that's different for for uh, for, for me to experience coming from there out to a region where people are kind of over here and over there, um, getting to know your neighbors is a little bit more challenging. <laughs> Especially in this, uh, this pandemic kind of era that we're living through. Mm. Um, but for the, and I'm still discovering a lot about other wines produced by our neighbors out here. Uh, but the people that I have met have been, Everyone in the wine industry is so nice and friendly. Um, and I think moving forward, working together is you know, the way we put this region of the Willamette Valley on the map. And, and um, yeah. What about like selling wine, find, finding customers, getting, getting people here. Has, how how mm -hmm. have you gone about that and, and how has it changed, I guess, since in, in the few short years the place has been open? Yeah, so we're a bed and breakfast here as well, so that's been a big challenge this year with the pandemic. Um, our kind of way we draw people in is the site itself. I mean, you can't see it behind me, but out here there's vineyard that overlooks a a valley and up here there's vineyard and that overlooks the other side of the valley um, that is kind of the drawing point it's kind of a relaxed setting for people to experience and taste wine um, pandemic we and all of our tastings are outside in the summertime anyway so that really hasn't changed a whole lot with the with the pandemic um, but obviously people are less apt to going out and exploring and stuff so that's I think impacted the industry as a whole anyway but uh, yeah like I said we we do our, all of our tastings outside one thing that we had to change was typically we'd like to go and pour a, each bottle separately one by one and talk to our customers like one on one while we pour the wines um, in a normal year but 
in the pandemic, we, we changed our um, practices to deliver all of our wine at once in these carafes, and the response from the consumers has been really, really positive, actually. And they like the aspect of, they see all of the wines that they're tasting in front of them, and they kind of get a part of pouring that wine into the glass and having that that tactile experience with the wine tasting for them, I think is proving to be a really positive um, attribution of the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. it sounds terrible, but mm -hmm. that's been a really cool discovery for our um, tasting room protocols mm -hmm. and seeing what consumers like. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been really fascinating to see. Um, yeah. Uh, other than that, not much else is different, mm -hmm. but I think that practice might stick in the future, mm -hmm. after, you know, post-pandemic, but delivering all the wines to the, to the customers and then, you know, giving our, our talk about each one of them as they go along. We kind of visit with our customers as uh, they taste through their wines. Mm -hmm. so, um, all of that will remain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen a growth in num numbers? I mean, before the pandemic, were yeah. you seeing a growth in numbers of people coming and yeah. people staying? Yeah, yeah. The, there, the bed and breakfast was booked pre-pandemic um, almost every weekend, so that's been a big change, unfortunately. And um, there were times you know, during harvest when our bed and breakfast members would volunteer and help us pick, too. So they, that. That might be different this year. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, we, yeah, we were, like you're saying, we were, we're a new winery and we were experiencing, you know, this, this growth and awareness. So I think that's kind of impacted everyone in the industry, just kind of uh, a stalling of, of consumers. So I think that in that aspect, we're not so different than many other places. But um, we are coming up with some new strategies in this era. Um, it's hard, it's, it's really hard because we want to employ some techno technological aspects to um, our tasting experiences and our wine uh, purchasing experiences, and we have, and we've done a lot of virtual tastings and stuff like that, but uh, I think a lot of people are a little fatigued with technology at this point and uh, trying to come up with new ways to reach out to new consumers and retain our members and mm -hmm. stuff like that are um, it's a little bit a little bit of a challenge in this in this pandemic era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we're working on some stuff right now that uh, will hopefully bring in some awareness and attention to uh, tasting wine purchases and uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. We want to give consu you know consumers that, that experience still, but um, I feel like right now in July, everyone's just a little bit fatigued with with uh, with everything. With everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with everything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it takes some brainstorming, and there's a tremendous opportunity in times like this for creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the creative minds will will do very well in times like this, and that's what it's going to take. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, you, you talked earlier about these wines that you're, you're, you're working on now being sort of the first ones that you've sort of, that have been your contribution, your, your, mm -hmm. your, your, so now you're taking wines to market that you, that are yours in, mm -hmm. in a way, so I'm, I'm curious about that sort of feeling when you're pouring wine, or in this case, pouring a carafe for people to taste of a wine that you created and, and how that feels and, and how you deal with the people who don't love the product you're giving them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I I love the people who don't love the product as much as I love the people who do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, who am I to judge them for what they like or don't like, you know? Uh, what, and, I, and I've encountered that before when I'm pouring some, some wines that I, even I haven't made. Um, I still have a, a feeling for those wines, and, but I'm not going to wrong someone for something they dislike. I, all the power to them. Like, yeah, I mean, some people don't like that, you know? And that's totally cool and understandable. I, I'm, I'm about people tasting wine. I'm not about people tasting our wine. I'm about people trying wine. I just want more consumers to look at this product and how, how cool wine can be and how, how much variation there is within the products. And, I just want people to try wine. I don't care if they, if they like it or not. I just want them to try it. Yeah. I like it. It's yeah. good, good philosophy. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> Obviously, you're you're uh, you're still pretty new to the industry, but I'm yeah. curious if there's anything you've noticed, uh, if there any changes to the industry you've noticed. Again, pandemic notwithstanding, but anything about Oregon wine that had changed since you've been a part of it uh, between kind of first impressions to now and, and what it looks like now in 2020. Yeah, big, <clears throat> big question. <laughs> it's a big question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, growth has been tremendous with the wineries that I've worked at. Like I said, A, a to Z is not um, doesn't look the same on the outside from when I worked there in 2014 and 15. Uh, so that aspect has changed. A lot of wineries are doing well, really well, and they're growing. And Oregon itself is getting more and more recognition across the world and across uh, the United States. So that's really a positive aspect and um, the trend of global warming is also pushing a lot of that um, production up north. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of those changes too. Um, And what was the second part of the question? Sort of what is, what, how would you define Oregon wine? What, what, where, where, what, what is it right now in 2020? What, is it, what does it look like on a local, national, global scale? Hmm. What does Oregon wine look like on the, in 2020? That's a hard question to answer. It's a really hard question to answer. I think everyone's holding their own. I, I don't think uh, anyone's really fall into the wayside. Uh, Oregon's really creative and inventive and our products are outstanding. So that standard will always showcase itself. Mm -hmm. I think people will notice, people notice that regardless and um, in, the, in the era of a pandemic, everything just kind of seems stalled anyway. So I think a lot of it is focused on retention of customers and it's, it's really hard to, to, to reach out to new people in something like this. Um, that's, that's the biggest challenge of 2020 is reaching out to new consumers and uh, all of our restaurants and stuff who are suffering. Uh, I really feel for them. That's, that's, that's what 2020 looks like is not being able to, not being able to do the things that you should be able to do with wine and pair it with food and big things, big important things like that. Um, I think it's great that people are still going out to tasting rooms, that we still have that opportunity, but we're missing, we're missing our partners, we're mm -hmm. missing our restaurants and um, certainly could use them and, and that, that community and that camaraderie with them. When, and yeah, I miss, I miss, I was just about to, um, before this pandemic hit, I was about to start um, kind of going into sh shops and doing pourings and tastings, which I hadn't really previously done. And um, that kind of all changed it. So I don't have a whole lot of experience with, with that aspect of it. Um, but, you know, once this is all over, we we'll get, we'll get to that eventually, mm -hmm. day by day. <laughs> day by day. Day by day. Yeah. And that's the theme of 2020. Yeah, day, it's a day at a time. That's, that's, that's 2020. Just a day at a time. Just keep, 
keep making your product focus on your craft and that's kind of what I've been doing is really honing in on what I want to see in the future and it's given me a really cool opportunity to be out here in the vineyard and, and focus on stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even amid all the distractions, it, it's fatiguing, so kind of to free your mind, you focus on the things you really like to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And wear out your body a little bit too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What about as you look ahead for Oregon wine? Uh, obviously, the, the, we're still, still dealing with pandemic, but as you look five or 10 years down the road, what, what is Oregon wine gonna look like? What's, what's gonna change in the industry? What will, what will the 2030 mm. Oregon wine industry look like? Again, it's a big question, wow. but just in your, in yeah. your, in your, from your perspective. Yeah, um, wow. I, I think a lot of people in the industry are talking about climate change and what, <laughs> what they're gonna grow. Um, Pinot and Pinot's still the king in Oregon. It's what, what um, makes us known, it's what has made us known. So that will remain constant. But I think, I'm just, yeah, I think people are gonna start experiencing with, experimenting with some other varieties. Um, we might see some other grapes pop up in the Oregon wine scene. And other wines pop up in the Oregon wine scene in the last five years of the next 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> And I think that's kind of, you can't, uh, it's, it's hard to immediately put a stop on, on the warming trend, but uh, that's, to diversify the industry, I think that's what we might see to, you know, anticipate a uh, warming trend, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is cool. And it's, It'll be cool to see some of those um, new wines pop up mm -hmm. in different wine styles. Um, maybe maybe some canned programs. Wine packaging might might change a little bit more. We might see more of that that aspect grow, and um, that's cool. I think I think uh, like I said, more people who can go out and experience wine, the, the better the industry fares um, nationally and globally. Um, that's what I want to see. I, I, I think there's a positive aspect to appealing to a broader array of consumers. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the wine industry is, has done a good job of this value-added product image and um, that will always remain, but I think I think some ingenuity and creativity will be cool to see mm -hmm. in terms of attracting new buyers, um, wine packaging styles and grape um, varieties and maybe even some of those uh, uh, like mixes. I've seen like, like uh, mimo mimosa mixes or stuff like that. I'm part of the alcohol industry. It's all cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> what about as you look, for, look ahead for the future for yourself and, and for Lubert Hill? What are, you, what are you looking at as you look ahead five, ten years? Yeah. Um, I like where I live. I love this area. I love living in Corvallis. It's my college town, and I, you know, it's a really, really cool town. There's forests and stuff here that I can go run trails on and mountain bike in and uh, I, I love this area and loving the area helps when you're uh, crafting this product in, in the same area. So five, ten years down the road at Bluebird Hill, I think the craft will just get better. The vintages will have their the vintages will be their vintages. You know, the weather will do what it will do, but I think we can only get better here at Bluebird Hill. There's a lot of there's a lot of room to, to grow, and I'm very excited about that. I'm, just, I'm very excited to see how the vines um, grow over the next 
five to ten years and what the wines do and what the industry does and how we address those those issues. Anything in particular you're looking excited to try or any experiments or like yeah. you, you mentioned new varietals or anything that you're kind of kind of on the on the docket for trying out? Yeah, uh, I had a friend who went down and worked in New Zealand last year and he told me that he worked at this winery who put one of their barrels out in the vineyard like on a hill and like out in the middle of the vineyard on a hill and did a fermentation out just like way away from the winery I was like oh well, that's kind of cool and we, we're on a hill and we could do that like we're not I mean our winery's right here and the vineyard's right there but uh, man that'd, that'd be kind of cool to experiment with and uh, there's a lot there's a lot we can do here um, the variables are endless in terms of experimenting. Uh, there's a lot I'm excited about trying. I think that's one thing is, is incorporating something off the wall like that once every vintage. <laughs> doing, doing some interesting fermentation and seeing where it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what would your words of wisdom be to someone who wanted to join the, the wine industry? Uh, man. Go in head first, like it's a, it's a cool dive. <laughs> yeah, you won't regret it. It'll teach, it'll teach you a lot about yourself and about the world. Cool. All right, last question for you. You're gonna get a little philosophical on okay. here. So, yeah. what, is, what is the role of wine in, in society? What is the role of wine in society? Connecting people, that's why I, that's why I got in this, is the, the connectedness I felt make, creating this craft. And then beyond that, the connectedness that wine affords people when they consume it. I think... <laughs> make wine, not war. Yeah, I think that's a good philosophy. It brings us together. If we all if we all did the things that you know Anthony Bourdain does and, and taste someone else's dish and go experience something that they've never experienced before, tried a different wine that they're scared of experiencing or, or just don't have any care to experience, just do it. Yeah, a lot to learn from trying new things. like it yeah excellent all the questions that I have for you is there anything I didn't ask that I should have anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered it was great yeah <laughs> okay yeah, it was it was cool excellent it was cool to get philosophical at the end <laughs> <laughs> we save it to the end so you can yeah. turn your brain to yeah exactly <laughs> well thank you so much well, for having us here today for showing us yeah. your amazing property and uh, we will we'll let you off the hook well thank you very much